and the Ad Council. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to the show Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke. I have three movies to review for you for this show and... After that, I'm going to give you my list of Oscar nominations and what I thought about them. A lot of people are talking already about Oscar snubs and what have you, but I'm going to get into that towards the end of the show. First, though, here's what's topping the box office. The top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. The number one movie at the box office is really surprising to me because I expected Star Wars The Last Jedi to be number one for five weeks not this movie for three weeks but Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle is still hanging in there at number one although other than the Star Wars movie Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle doesn't have a lot of competition around it and by the way even though it's been out for over a month now that's one of the movies I'll be reviewing for this show I'll get to that in a minute but this weekend Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle made $19.5 $19.5 million, which is not bad, but on a budget of 90 to $110 million, exact figure yet to be determined, Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle has so far grossed $316.5 million here in the States and $768.3 million worldwide, which makes it Regardless of whether it may took cost ninety million or one hundred ten million, it is most certainly a certified hit here in the states and around the world. So good for the Jumanji sequel. Twelve Strong is the highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it did not outseat Jumanji: Welcome to the Jungle as it's number two at the box office this past weekend, earning fifteen point eight million dollars at the U.S. box office against a budget of thirty five million dollars. Its international gross is sixteen point five million dollars, but either way, it's not a hit yet here in the states or around the world. We'll have to see whether or not it is in the coming weeks. Den of Thieves is number three at the box office this weekend and is also the number two highest grossing debut movie of the week. This weekend it grossed $15.2 million, just a fraction less than 12 strong, against a budget of $30 million. So I don't have the international numbers for Den of Thieves yet, but here in the States it is not a hit yet. We'll have to see whether or not it is in the coming weeks. The Post had an amazing climb. Uh, Two weeks ago, it was number 15 at the box office. Last week, it was number two. This week, it fell to number four, but that's to be expected, especially with the new movies coming out. But The Post has so far grossed $11.7 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $50 million, that's 5-0, The Post has so far grossed $44.8 million at the U.S. box office and $55.1 million around the world. So, even though The Post is not a hit yet here in the States, it is a tentative hit overseas, but it has grossed over one-fifth of its budget in just one weekend. And seeing that The Post... A little bit of a spoiler alert. Has been nominated for Best Picture. We'll see it in the top ten for a little while, I think. The Greatest Showman is number five at the box office this weekend, sliding slightly from number four last week. But The Greatest Showman earned $10.6 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $84 million, The Greatest Showman has so far grossed $113.1 million here in the States and... $231.3 million worldwide, which means it is a tentative hit here in the States, still holding steady in the number four, number five range, but around the world it is already a certified hit. So good for The Greatest Showman. Paddington 2 was number six of the box office when it debuted last week. This week, it is also number six, still holding steady, steady. And that actually is pretty impressive considering what movie debuted along with it that fell behind it. But I'll get to that a little bit later. This weekend, Paddington 2 grossed a an even $8 million. Against a budget of $50 million, that's 5-0, Paddington 2 has so far grossed eight, excuse me, $24.8 million here in the States and... 
172.2 million dollars worldwide showing that paddington 2 has a lot more clout internationally than it does in the united states but then again paddington bear is not an american character because he's from peru and he's raised in london but here in the states 24.8 million dollars that's not bad but it's international gross i think more than makes up for what it's lacking in the states but the movie that comes at number seven was actually number three last week and fell behind paddington 2 and that movie was the commuter took a big drop to number seven again from number three only grossing 6.6 million dollars at the u.s box office this past weekend against a budget of 30 million dollars the commuter has so far grossed 25.6 million dollars here in the states and 36.4 million dollars worldwide so it's not a hit yet here in the states around the world it's a tentative hit but i can't see it going past tentative given its box office numbers in the states next week or even the week after but we'll have to see star wars the last jedi the eighth episode in the star wars saga is number seven of the box office sliding from number oh excuse me number eight at the box office sliding from number five last week having only grossed 6.6 million dollars but here's a little bit i'm I'm not even going to build it up it's it's a certified hit here in the states and around the world on a budget of 200 million dollars it has grossed 604.3 million dollars here in the states and 1.296 billion dollars worldwide not bad for a movie that was number one at the u.s box office for only two weeks so no need to cry for star wars the last jedi especially if you loved the movie which some people did not it's doing really well Insidious: The Last Key is number nine at the box office this past week, or this past weekend, sliding from number seven last week. Insidious: The Last Key grossed five point nine million dollars in the U.S., but against a budget of ten million dollars, Insidious: The Last Key has so far grossed fifty-eight point seven million dollars here in the states and one hundred twenty-six point eight million dollars worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the states and around the world. It's unlikely to be in the top ten next week, but it's already certified so no need to cry for that movie and finally forever my girl which is a movie that actually didn't even open at a theater near me even though i'm in boston it grossed 4.2 million dollars at the u.s box office bringing it to number 10 and on a budget against a budget of 3.5 million dollars so already not really impressive in terms of top 10 but it's it's a tentative hit When is the best time to talk to your family about staying in touch during a disaster? When floodwaters reach your door? When wildfires are engulfing the edge of your neighborhood? Or an earthquake is destroying buildings? Or is the best time, perhaps, today? During a disaster, you may not be able to stay in touch with your family or friends as easily as you think. Go to ready.gov slash communicate and make your emergency plan today. Don't wait. Communicate. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is evening gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Just a reminder that Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com or WBCA in Boston. You are watching it on Somerville Community Access Television or some community access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast, and to them I say thank you, or you are watching and listening on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show is 12 Strong. This is a true story, and it is about the... First U.S. combat forces in Afghanistan after 9-11. So this is a movie that takes place in 2001. And it tells the story of the first special forces team deployed to Afghanistan under the leadership of a new captain. And the team must work with an Afghan warlord to take down 
the Taliban. And this is about the men of ODA, that is Operational Detachment Alpha 595, known by the cooler code name Task, Task Force Dagger, who helped to liberate a stronghold of Taliban and Al-Qaeda at in an area of Afghanistan called Mazar-e-Sharif within a matter of weeks. And what's special about ODA 595 is that they not only take down this Al-Qaeda stronghold, even though they're outnumbered, literally 5,000 to 1, but they also do a lot of their fighting on horseback. So what I really wanted to get from this movie is... I love true stories. I like war movies. What I didn't understand was why these soldiers had to be on horseback and what kind of advantage the horseback, being on horseback in Afghanistan had. And that was never really explained or even shown to me in this movie. And that's one of the the big faults of this film. Another fault is there are so many war movie cliches in this film and also a majority of the people who are fighting in this in this movie particularly on the american side don't look particularly weathered or like they haven't taken a shower in a couple of weeks even though these soldiers probably went through this so 12 strong is a movie that was okay it certainly had very good intentions and told an incredible true story but it came out in january for probably the same reason that any other movie that looks like Oscar bait would come out in January. In other words, it wasn't good enough. And again, it's it's a true story that is incredible, but again, some of the movie cliches include Captain Mitch Nelson, who's played in this movie by Chris Hemsworth, in a good supporting performance, I might add, but he is actually moving up to taking a desk job until... 9-11 happens. And one of the things that sets this movie off on the wrong note is that the movie begins on 9-11 at, as it says on the screen, 7.45 in the morning. Well, the only problem with that is that you see Chris Hemsworth getting his on-screen daughter ready for school, but then his daughter changes the channel, and then both t- uh, Twin Towers are shown up in flames, or rather with the planes already hitting them. And anyone who knows anything about 9-11, including people who lived through it, including me, is that the planes didn't actually collide into the Trade Center. The first one didn't until 8.47, exactly. And the second one didn't until 9.43. So if they can't get that detail right about 9-11, then why did they even show the time? Because the... The plane crashes didn't even happen until an hour after the movie (laughs) said it did. So that's one of the first things. The other thing is the problem with these movies that detail catastrophic events, especially like 9-11, is that no one seems to be legitimately surprised that this terrorist attack happens. It's almost like every actor in the movie sees it coming. But then again... The other problem with this Captain Mitch Nelson is sort of in the war cliche territory where he addresses his superiors such as a a character in this movie played by William Fitchner whose name is Colonel Mulholland. He's, he gets, or, Lieutenant Colonel Bowers, who's played by Rob Riggle, who is a comic actor but actually did serve in the military after 9-11 and came back to, to a pretty successful showbiz career as well. But that's beside the point. But Captain Mitch Nelson is still addressing his superiors and out of tune, just, just saying, I can't stay on the sidelines for this. I have to go in. That's we've seen that in so many other movies before. And what's more is there's another character who does it, a person who is going into retirement by the name of Hal Spencer, who's played by Michael Shannon. And he literally goes to his superior's offices and rips up his retirement papers so he can serve in Afghanistan. Now this is very noble, but unfortunately it is a war movie cliche. There's also another member of this Green Beret unit by the name of Ben Milo, who's played by Travante Rose who is a good actor again but there's a cliche where he has a afghani kid following him throughout the movie and 
I, I almost could feel that there was some sort of connection they would make, probably involving snack food. And once I thought about that, guess what happens? Well, Ben Milo introduces this Afghani kid to some American sweet, and then he actually does it again with another sweet later on in the movie. And what I found interesting about the casting of Trevante Rhodes is that when they show the actual Green Beret unit at the end of the film, there's not a single black person in that picture, whereas Trevante Rhodes is an African-American. Uh, for those of you who are listening on radio and can't see the, the pictures that I'm seeing. So I don't exactly know why they they cast an African-American actor. Not that I'm against it, but if you're, if you're trying to be historically accurate, that probably wasn't the right move. So 12 Strong had good intentions, but I would not rank this even close to such great war films as Saving Private Ryan, All Quiet on the Western Front, Platoon. It just was too flashy, too cliche-ridden, and it gets my rating of a low checkout. Again, it's not an entirely disappointing movie, and I guess I go into this in January, kind of keeping my expectations low in general, because a lot of the new movies that come out in January are bad anyway. 12 Strong's not bad, be hard to believe. but but people Not just great. like you are already saving money. Feedthepig.org makes it easy. Their simple savings plan teaches you how to start saving without going overboard. So you don't need to sell all your belongings and live in a commune. These dungarees belong to all of us now, Tom. You don't need to get a second job as a stuntman. We need a new stuntman! You just need feedthepig.org. Don't get left behind. Get tips and tools at feedthepig.org. Brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Den of Thieves. This is a gritty crime saga which follows the lives of an elite unit of the L.A. County Sheriff's Department and the state's most successful bank robbery crew as the outlaws plan a seemingly impossible heist on the Federal Reserve Bank in Los Angeles. So if the plot of Den of Thieves sounds familiar. It's probably because Den of Thieves bears maybe not too much of an uncanny resemblance to the movie Heat, which came out 23 years ago, directed by Michael Mann, and starred Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. So, one of the things that gets the movie off on the wrong note is that Gerard Butler is in the film. And Gerard Butler is pretty much a one-note actor who keeps getting these big screen roles. Admittedly, Gerard Butler's role in this film is better than the ones he's played for such movies as Gods of Egypt, for instance, and London Has Fallen. But, interestingly enough, the director of this movie, who also co-wrote the screenplay, Christian Gudegast, actually also wrote the screenplay for... London Has Fallen, and this is actually his directorial debut. He certainly has a lot of influence from... The, the likes of Michael Mann in terms of getting a a crime saga together, especially one where a, a, a heist is, is involved. But I can't say that this film particularly stayed with me. I do have to say that some of the performances in the movie were a lot better than I thought they would, probably most notably 50 Cent or Curtis 50 Cent Jackson as... Um, one of the bank robbers, Levi Ensign. Also, the leader of this bank robbing unit is a guy by the name of Merriman, who's played by Pablo Schreiber. And Pablo Schreiber's name might not sound particularly familiar, but actually, he's probably best known for playing 
George Pornstash Mendez on the show Orange is the New Black, which he was on for uh, four seasons. And he's a good actor. He's going to certainly play an asshole very well. In this movie, he's, I guess you'd say, the good guy, if you want to call him that. Actually, the bank robbers were a lot more likable than the than the cops who were chasing them, especially Gerard Butler. But I don't know if that was the idea of the movie. I, I really can't say. But regardless, what I wanted to see when I saw this movie was a good heist film. And unfortunately, even though this movie had surprisingly good acting performances by the likes of Pablo Schreiber, 50 Cent, and O'Shea Jackson Jr., who you might remember as playing... Ice Cube in Straight Outta Compton, which is a movie that people are still talking about today. I just didn't really find the robbery part of the film particularly intriguing. And that should have been intriguing. Instead, I actually found myself nodding off during it. And I wasn't sure exactly why it was. At first, the movie has a very explosive heist gone wrong where this group of bank robbers actually rob a a an armored vehicle and the the thing the heist goes wrong when a there's no money in the armored vehicle and b one of the guards of the armored vehicle just has his coffee just drops his coffee and one of the trigger happy members of the bank robbing crew shoots him which results in some police officers being killed so the only way that these bank robbers are going to be likable is if one of them laments the fact that they just killed a bunch of cops and fortunately pablo schreiber's character merriman does that but there there could have been a subplot here involving one of the Trigger happy bank robbers actually paying for his mistake, but that never happens. And in fact, the the robber who unfortunately whose trigger happiness j- re- resulted in that shootout is never really mentioned again. In, in fact, he's there, but his character is just pushed to the back. So now that I've told you enough about the bank robbers in this case, how about the L.A. County Sheriff's Department? Let, let me just get into that. First of all, Gerard Butler plays a tough guy. It is a one-note performance, but probably more of a one-and-a-half-note performance because Gerard Butler, unlike many of his other films, probably over the last five years, actually shows some initiative initiative in his acting. In other words, he actually acts like he wants to be there and that he takes his job seriously. Of course, his tough guy cop can be easily compared to Al Pacino's character in Heat. When Al Pacino, of course, Gerard Butler cannot top Pacino. He just can't. Also, there are parts where Nick Flanagan does really dubious things in his his character like for instance he takes in the character of donnie o'shea jackson jr who's a member of this bank robbing crew and wants to have him as a rat but then he sees donnie with these other bank robbers at a bar and starts talking to him almost under the guise that he's just a guy he saw at the gym which seems like a really really bad idea not only because it could potentially blow this sheriff's cover but also it could get the character of donnie o'shea jackson jr's character killed and it does present a confrontation within the bank robbing crew but ultimately it's one that is brought to light one moment and then not mentioned the next moment there was a really good scene, actually, where 50 Cent has a, a wife and a daughter who's going to prom, and when her prom date shows up, 50 Cent in character has this sort of man-to-man talk with him, which results in 50 Cent taking him to the garage where all the other bank robbing crew in all their machismo are, are there to yeah, give him a stern warning. Some people thought that scene was unnecessary. I actually thought that was funny and one of the highlights of the movie. But this movie at 2 hours and 20 minutes felt way too long. I thought they could have cut some of the scenes, including the parts where Nick Flanagan just puts himself and his 
key witness in jeopardy. I didn't think that was necessary at all. And the bank and the robbery of the Federal Reserve was basically a snooze fest. So Den of Thieves probably won't be on my list of worst of the year, but it gets my rating of a strikeout because this is a movie that probably shouldn't have borrowed as much from the movie Heat, and it could have been so much more had it trimmed the fat. Hi, this is Josh Groban. My favorite thing about music is its ability to inspire and nourish the soul. That's why I'm proud to work with Feeding America, an organization that inspires hope for families in need and helps nourish the 16 million kids in this country struggling with hunger. The Feeding America nationwide network of food banks gathers surplus food and helps get it to kids in need. But they can't do it alone. Find out how you can help at feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Never Stop the Madness, Tuesdays at 9 p.m. BostonFreeRadio.com Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Just a reminder, you are listening to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio or WBCA. You are watching and listening to the show on SCAT TV, or some community access TV station that's kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them, I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to the show on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle. Now, this movie came out on December 20th of last year. So, why am I reviewing it now? Basically because my My last show last year was December 17th, and I didn't have shows on December 26th or January 2nd because of the holiday break. So I was able to come back on January 9th, and I did my special best and worst show of 2017, and Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle sort of fell behind on my list of movies to review. But since it's still number one at the box office, I decided to give it my best shot, or rather, give it the review that I think it deserves. So, this is a movie that is kind of a sequel to the Jumanji from 1995, which starred Robin Williams and Bonnie Hunt, but it seems to be a little bit more of a spinoff, because there are some connections here and there between this movie and the original Jumanji, but Altogether, this is a movie that feels a little bit more like a spinoff, but it's a movie about four teenagers who are sucked into a magical video game, and the only way they can escape is to work together to finish the game. So this is a plot that's very similar to the original Jumanji, except in that Jumanji, Jumanji was from 1995, and the book by Chris Van Allisburg, Jumanji was a board game. So the way that... Jumanji is actually discovered in this movie as a board game. It's found washed up on the beach, and some kid's father gives it to his son as a gift, and the kid, who's who's living in 1995, kind of tosses it aside and says, who needs board games? But then the game, the board game magically transforms itself into a video game. For what console? Super Nintendo? Sega Genesis? Who cares? It's just... The Jumanji board game, I guess, is magically able to transform itself. It's a little bit of a contrivance and plot, but again, I I guess it, it works to a certain extent. So there are these four teenagers, 22 years later, who are actually all serving detention together. There's Spencer, who's played by Alex Wolf. There's a football player named Fridge. And he's only known by Fridge. I guess he doesn't have a real name in this movie. Who's played by Sidarius Blaine. And the reason these two get in trouble is because Spencer is doing Fridge's homework for him in order for Fridge to stay on the football team. And eventually the 
higher ups in the school take note of that there's also a beautiful young girl named bethany who's played by madison eisenman who's one of those women who is very attractive and knows it and it's because of her chatting on social media during a test that she gets a detention and then there is a young awkward girl named martha who's played by morgan turner who gets detention for basically mouthing off to her gym teacher in gym class so the two of them are in or excuse me the four of them are are all in detention together four kids with nothing in common and they eventually dig around and find a a, that jumanji video game and the console to play it and they all get to playing it and eventually once the game gets started they all get sucked into the the game spencer becomes a big brooding hulk of a man played by dwayne johnson fridge becomes a much shorter person played by kevin hart bethany becomes a man who's also not particularly attractive played by jack black and martha becomes kind of a lara croft feminine but sexy character played by karen gillen so they're all together with these new personalities and This is the part of the movie that I found to be the best. Yeah, it was kind of contrived when Jumanji turned into a video game for some unexplainable reason. I guess magic is the only thing they had here. But I liked how these characters adapted to their avatars. And I loved how Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart most especially adapted to their characters as much. I think they tapped into some sort of acting skill where they knew what it was like to be the skinny kid or the really popular kid i'm not sure if kevin hart knew what it was like to be the popular kid who was good at athletics but then again he played that kind of character convincingly in the movie he did with dwayne johnson two years ago which was central intelligence so the two of them are back together again and as i said in my review of central intelligence two years ago they really did make a surprisingly good comic team but In addition to that, Jack Black is again really funny in this movie as a girl who is surprised that she's a guy. And I I thought that Jack Black had some really funny parts in this film as well. And last but not least, Karen Gillan, I also thought, had some incredible scenes with Dwayne Johnson because the characters of Spencer and Martha are obviously attracted to one another. But I, I thought that Karen Gillan played well into her insecurities probably uh, almost about as much as Dwayne Johnson did. In addition to that, one of the biggest surprises of this movie was that even though Dwayne Johnson was in it, Kevin Hart, Jack Black, characters who who not only act really well but are also funny, I I did have the expectation that this would be a cheap tie-in to the original 1995 movie and was made solely to grab money from the millennials who grew up watching that film i was wrong about that i mean maybe there was that little bit of a commercial tie-in there but overall what i loved about this film was unlike the last film i saw with dwayne johnson baywatch this didn't feel like a cheap tie-in and maybe with dwayne johnson in the title role i expected that but it was a lot better and a lot funnier than i thought it would be and jumanji welcome to the jungle gets my rating of a knockout because not only is it a funny film it also is a compelling movie you certainly want to see these characters survive and you want to see them thrive in this wilderness and i saw that and i really enjoyed this film every hiring manager knows that a company is only as good as the people it's made from so where do you find the best people that may surprise you meet the grads of life young adults of unique determination and experience an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position internship or even mentorship they might not have every qualification you typically look for but they're exactly who your company needs this is talent worth knowing about go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find cultivate and train this great pool of untapped talent brought to you by the ad council and gradsoflife.org She 
Lights of Heavy on Tuesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern on BostonFreeRadio.com. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And I've reviewed three movies for this show. Usually I try to make it maximum five, and there are more than five films that I have in the pipeline that I've yet to review for this show, including some that are Oscar nominees. But I'm going to cut the reviews short for now, but not the show short. Instead, I'm going to give you the... Oscar nominees that were recently announced on Tuesday, January 23rd at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And the reason is because, well, I do this every year, but also there are a lot of surprises in terms of nominees. So I'm going to get right into that right now. So first off is the best picture nominees there were nine movies out of a maximum ten that were nominated for best picture and they are in alphabetical order call me by your name darkest hour dunkirk get out ladybird phantom thread the post the shape of water and three billboards outside ebbing missouri so of these films which ones did i think not deserve to be nominated well that's really tough because i think all of them received a lot of critical acclaim darkest hour dunkirk and get out definitely did not surprise me at all or three billboards outside ebbing missouri as a matter of fact i feel bad that some of these didn't make my top 10 list but i'm not feeling too bad but I would probably say, I didn't review this this movie on the show yet, but Call Me By Your Name, I didn't get into as much as other people did. Of course, I'm in the vast minority because Call Me By Your Name earned a 97% approval rating on RottenTomatoes.com. However, I would have liked to have seen probably Wonder Woman be nominated for Best Picture because I did think that that movie should have been nominated for something instead wonder woman received absolutely zero nominations not even in the technical category and i think wonder woman actually deserved better there is a movie out called in the fade which i can't really vouch for because i haven't seen it 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 didn't come out in theaters near me but it probably will soon but a lot of other critics are vouching for it so i can't exactly say whether or not (laughs) <laughs> that film should have been um, nominated. But I do think that if I were to knock Call Me By Your Name on put another film in its place, it would probably be Wind River. It, it, it really surprises me that Wind River didn't get nominated for anything, despite the fact that I thought it was a better movie than Hell or High Water, which did get nominated for Best Picture last year. Didn't even come close to winning, but in any event, I'll get to what movies I think should have won in the next few weeks probably the week before the oscars but those are the best picture nominations best actor in a leading role the nominees are timothy chalamet for call me by your name daniel day lewis phantom thread daniel kaluuya for get out gary oldman for darkest hour and denzel washington for roman j israel esquire so i think all five of these nominees are deserved if i were to knock one of them out it would probably be timothy chalamet for call me by your name and i'd probably replace him with maybe tom hanks for the post but then again i'm I'm not entirely sure yeah tom hanks was probably the biggest snub in this category and maybe i'd also replace it with dave franco not james franco for the disaster artist as a matter of fact there's a lot of there are a lot of people who say that James Franco was, was snubbed for The Disaster Artist. I personally don't think so, because as I said in my original review of The Disaster Artist, The Disaster Artist was a really good film. I did think Dave Franco did a great job, and why he's not getting any, why he didn't get any award season buzz, I don't know. Also, James Franco, even though he's a very good actor, he played weird 
and I don't think it's it's hard to play weird. So I think his his acting was a little overrated in that category. But there's also some controversy going on with James Franco because there are some women who have come forward accusing James Franco of sexual assault. Was that the reason he didn't get nominated? Maybe. But either way, I don't particularly miss him in this category. So moving on. Best Actress in a Leading Role. The nominees are Sally Hawkins, The Shape of Water, Frances McDormand, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, Margot Robbie, I, Tanya, Saoirse Ronan, Lady Bird, and Meryl Streep for The Post. So Meryl Streep is probably the least surprising nomination in this category. However, unlike last year when she was nominated for for oh boy um i f- forgot the name the, the name of the movie is is slipping my mind it's ah. anyway unlike last year where she was nominated for something she probably didn't deserve to be nominated for she deserved to be nominated this year i would probably not have nominated margot robbie for i tanya because even though the movie was good i thought margot robbie was miscast but that said, I do think Margot Robbie did a, a good job in her in her performance. She certainly gave the role a lot of depth and gravitas. I just I I didn't think it was a particularly perfect movie, but the performances in the movie, particularly by Margot Robbie and Allison Janney, were worth I think um, award consideration. So for supporting actor, the nominees are. Willem Dafoe, The Florida Project, Woody Harrelson, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, Richard Jenkins, The Shape of Water, Christopher Plummer, All the Money in the World, and Sam Rockwell for Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. And by the way, I just remembered the the movie that Meryl Streep was in last year that for which she didn't deserve to be nominated, Florence Foster Jenkins. I was thinking of a number of women who had three names, none of whom were FFJ, but that was the movie. So anyway, supporting actor. I think, I, I don't know if there are any really big surprises in this category i probably would have nominated somebody from the movie detroit particularly and i i don't have the the names of the actors that i i think should have been nominated but detroit got snubbed for just about everything and i think it was a better movie than a lot of people gave it credit for being Okay, Sarah, I'm dropping you at Emily's, and Josh, you're going to soccer, right? Yeah. Yep. Oh, and by the way, when I pick you up, I'll be wearing my short shorts. What? No! Yep, me and my short shorts doing my daddy dance. Your friends will love it. No! Well, I might change my mind if you buckle your seatbelts. Okay, okay, we're buckling up. See, all buckled. Whatever it takes, keep them safe. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup for more information. I love those real six sides They're the ones that move me A thinly blow Neurotic toe Intensify and groove me all this and more on Unpopular Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Continuing with my discussion of the Oscar nominees, I was talking about the nominees for Best Supporting Actor, and I do think that for Detroit, at least Will Poulter should have been in consideration for his role in the movie, because I, I, don't, I think he played a three-dimensional character that was just plain evil, and I... I, I particularly took to his performance in Detroit. Why he didn't get nominated, I don't know. If, if there was somebody with whom I would have replaced him, I think it probably would have been Woody Harrelson for three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, if I were to pick one. But all things considered, the supporting actor categories I also thought were pretty solid. Now on to supporting actress. The nominees are Mary J. Blige for Mudbound, Allison Janney, I, Tanya, 
Leslie Manville for Phantom Thread, Lori Metcalf, Lady Bird, and Octavia Spencer for The Shape of Water. Again, all worthy performances, except I have not seen Mudbound, so I can't vouch for Mary J. Blige, but it is really nice to see her actually nominated for an Academy Award. I didn't expect that, particularly in the acting category. Is there anyone here who I'd replace? Maybe Octavia Spencer, but there is one actress who I thought probably should have been considered for Best Supporting Actress, uh, amongst others. And I I think I wouldn't have been shocked to have seen Tiffany Haddish here in, in this category for Girls' Night because I think I loved her in that movie. She certainly stood out amongst the other three actresses who were better known than her. And I thought she <laughs> was w- one of the standout performances of the year. But then again, I, I I'm not entirely disappointed with the people in the supporting actress category. There is one other that I can't quite think of right now who I think also might have been nominated for Best Supporting Actress. I can't think of it right now. I'll get back to it if I think about it. So, for Best Director, the nominees are Dunkirk, Christopher Nolan. I'll I'll say the name first, then the movie. So, Christopher Nolan for Dunkirk, Jordan Peele for Get Out, Greta Gerwig for Lady Bird, Paul Thomas Anderson for Phantom Thread, and Guillermo del Toro for The Shape of Water. Now, normally I'd be crying foul for Steven Spielberg not getting nominated for The Post, but then again, we have a pretty historic number of nominations for Best Director. Jordan Peele is nominated for his debut film, and he is the fifth African-American to be nominated for Best Director, which is quite a feat, and my hat is off to him for that. Greta Gerwig being nominated for Lady Bird, that's also very well deserved, so very good for Greta Gerwig, and she could have a successful career as... That sounds patronizing, but she could have a solid career as a director if she, you know, decides not to act again, which also is unlikely. That's what I was going for. So in this Best Director category, we have a black man, a Mexican man, and a woman nominated for Best Director. I think that's quite a feat. So animated feature, for Best Animated Feature, this is where I probably would contest the most the nominees are the boss baby if you want to know the filmmakers tom mcgrath and ramsey and nato the breadwinner nora tuomi and anthony leo coco lee unkrich and darla k anderson ferdinand carlos saldana and loving vincent dorita cobiela hugh welchman Sean Bobbitt, Yvonne McTaggart, and Hugh Welchman. So I have not seen The Breadwinner or Loving Vincent. I've heard great things about them, but they didn't come out in a theater near me, so I have not seen them yet. Coco definitely deserved to be nominated because it is not only a great animated film, but a great movie, period. As a matter of fact, it could have been nominated for Best Picture as well. But... I don't know what the boss baby is doing there, or Ferdinand. Ferdinand, I thought, was decidedly mediocre, and the boss baby was just flat-out bad. I don't know why that's nominated for Best Animated Feature, but then again, I guess when you compare the boss baby to the Emoji Movie, it's a great film. I probably would have actually nominated the Lego Batman movie for Best Animated Feature. I And if that seems like a, a bad choice, well... First of all, consider that the Lego movie was nominated back in 2014 for several awards. And also, the Boss Baby was just bad. It didn't make sense to me. It was well animated, I suppose, but the idea of somebody giving birth to a baby in a suit, that's just stupid. And Ferdinand, I thought, was too desperate to make the kids laugh, so I wouldn't have included that one either. But I can't think of another animated film besides the Lego Batman movie that I think would have been more 
uh, suited to it. But anyway, now on to the screenplay categories. First, adapted screenplay. The nominees are Call Me By Your Name, James Ivory, The Disaster Artist, Scott Newtstatter and Michael H. Weber, Logan, Scott Frank and James Mangold and Michael Green, Molly's Game, Aaron Sorkin, and Mudbound, Virgil Williams and D. Rees. Now, I can't vouch for Mudbound because I haven't seen it yet, but all these other uh, nominations are quite surprising. Perhaps the most surprising is Logan. But that being said, it's surprising, yet I do think that Logan is actually deserving of an Adapted Screenplay nomination. It's just kind of surprising that it didn't get nominated for anything else. Um... Now on to Best Original Screenplay. The nominees are The Big Sick, Emily V. Gordon and Kumail Nanjiani, Get Out, Jordan Peele, Lady Bird, Greta Gerwig, The Shape of Water, Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro and Vanessa Taylor, and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, Martin McDonough. Now that I see that The Big Sick has been nominated for Best Original Screenplay, that reminds me of the snub for Best Supporting Actress. Holly Hunter should have been nominated for Best Supporting Actress for The Big Sick. That said, it is good to see The Big Sick get nominated for an award it deserves, which I didn't think a movie with the involvement of Judd Apatow would get nominated for anything, especially since The 40-Year-Old Virgin was snubbed back in 2005. The Western Scrub Jay. I was taking my science class on a virtual reality bird watching expedition. All of a sudden, Charlie Kane shouts, arr, arr. He had spotted the elusive black swift, a bird rarely seen in the wild. For a brief moment, Charlie had not the eyes of a nine year old boy, he had the eyes of an eagle. Teachers just have better work stories. Find out how creative teaching can be at teachdfw.org. Brought to you by Teach and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I'm continuing with my take on the Oscar nominees as I'm going down the list. So, the next category I'm going to cover is Best Documentary Feature. This is one I always get wrong. I see a lot of great documentaries, and two things happen. One, at least one documentary for which I vouch hard does not get nominated. And two, there are at least three best documentary features I haven't seen or haven't come out in a theater near me yet. So this this category, again, I, there are a few movies that I think were, were snubbed in this category. But first, here are the nominations. Best documentary feature. The nominees are... Abacus, Small Enough to Jail, Faces Places, Icarus, Last Man in, oh, excuse me, Last Men in Aleppo, and Strong Island. So, of these documentary features, the only one I've actually seen is Abacus, Small Enough to Jail. And that's directed by Steve James, who also directed, amongst other movies, Roger Ebert's film Life Itself, which I was so angry was snubbed for an Oscar. So, Abigail Small Enough to Jail is a really good documentary feature. It deserves to be nominated. I can't say whether or not the other four deserve to be nominated or not. I, I assume they did, but I haven't personally seen them, so I really can't say. But Abigail Small Enough to Jail was a, a a really good documentary. Will it win? I have no idea. I am always wrong about the documentary feature category. Always wrong, because there are so many documentaries. But the two documentaries in particular that I am really disappointed were not nominated for Best Documentary Feature are An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power, which I would put on my top ten list at the well at the end of last year, and the movie Jane, which was the story about Jane Goodall. I am really disappointed that neither of those films were nominated, but again, best documentary feature category is one of those categories where being 
nominated or being snubbed means never having to say you're sorry. So I would probably go into the short subjects for best documentary, best live action short film, and best foreign language film. But again, I haven't seen any of these films, so I can't say whether or not they are worth seeing or not. I guess I'll briefly go through the best foreign language film. Uh, The nominees are A Fantastic Woman from Chile, The Insult from Lebanon, Loveless from Russia, On Body and Soul from Hungary, and The Square from Sweden. So, of these films, the only one I've seen is The Square, and I think that probably deserves to be nominated. That was a movie that was kind of out there. I did think it was pretentious in a lot of parts, but I I think it's uh, probably appropriate for it to be nominated for Best Foreign Language Film, even though I think most people spoke English throughout the film, but in any in any case, it's a foreign film, not a foreign language film, but it kind of works. So let's see. The other categories are technical, except perhaps for original song. So the original song categories are as follows. The nominees are Mighty River from Mudbound, performed by Mary J. Blige, Mystery of Love from Call Me By Your Name, performed by Sufjan Stevens, Remember Me from Coco, which I think was written by, not performed by, Kristen Anderson Lopez and Robert Lopez, who I think might have written Let It Go, but don't quote me on that. I could be wrong about that. Stand Up for Something from Marshall, written by Diane Warren and Common and performed by Common. And This Is Me from The Greatest Showman, written by Benji Pasek and Justin Paul. So, I didn't see the movie Marshall, so I can't vouch for Stand Up for Something. That's one of those films that came out, but I didn't get a chance to see it. I would be livid if Remember Me wasn't nominated for this category. Um, Mudbound is a movie I haven't seen. I can't vouch for that yet, but I will make it a point to see Mudbound for next week's show. That I promise you. And I loved a lot of the songs from The Greatest Showman including This Is Me, which was sung by the freaks in the movie. I, I love that song. I thought not only was it really catchy, but it also was performed very well by the cast, including the woman who played the bearded woman. I, I just thought that was amongst the great songs in that movie. This Is Me was the one that stood out the most. But Remember Me seems like the favorite for this category but again i'm not playing favorites yet that will be on a later show meanwhile that's it for words on film for this week thank you so much for tuning into words on film which is again the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures just as a reminder the views and opinions expressed on words on film are are solely those of yours truly your host and movie critic dan burke and they do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole this is dan burke saying i'll see you at the movies